Hello, everyone. This is Marita, one who catches lightning with the Path of Ish podcast, Walking with Our Shadow, where we share ancient indigenous teachings of remembrance, all so we can walk and learn how to walk a path of radical self love. So it is with gratitude, grace, and thanksgiving that we sit around the circle today. And I'm super excited to invite to the circle someone that I've been following on social media. Yes, I have a tendency of doing that. Someone who I think is building a really important part of the bridge out there. So I'd like to bring to the circle Wes. And Wes is going to introduce themselves and tell us their creation story. And we're going to have a really fun time. We are recording this on the full buck moon. So I think it should be quite exciting. So Wes, welcome to the circle. Thank you. It's so glad to be here. And wow, yes, the potency is real. And I would believe that this potency of this moment is a mirror to our natural state. And I would say that that's been interesting spending a lifetime getting naturalized to that natural state of potency. And as we were just conversing, the full moon is bringing about that kind of final cleaving of these old beliefs that we all personally had about ourselves, our different wounds that carried our wisdom. But we realize the weight of the wounds gets to go away and we can actually just pack up the wisdom and put it in a fanny pack and walk forward through whatever this next gate is that's asking us to show up and be responsible for what is next. So, mm. yeah, <laughs> feel into that. So, Wes, in your own uh, in your own way of storytelling, because you are a storyteller, why don't you tell us your creation story? Yeah. How have you become this obsidian blade? Yeah. of truth. Yeah, thank you. It's been an interesting journey and I'll I'll just add before I start it, you know, it, one of the hardest parts of this creation story has been the fact that my self-awareness has been mostly generated from within. Hmm. My rememberings, my learnings and often that has been a challenge because we're exiting an age where People demand that you come from a certain school or a certain belief or a certain system, and they want validation because they've lost their own inner navigation. And so my story guided me to follow my own inner navigation right from the beginning. And I always had an inclination towards the cosmos. You can see photos of me as a four-year-old playing with different space sets and when I was five years old in 1977, that's when Star Wars came out. And that blew everyone's mind. That, that actually reintroduced myth back to the masses in such a huge way, mm -hmm. especially with the tutor, the mentor, the guide, the spiritual guide of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And that was like one of the main characters that really ignited me in the concept of the Force. And so that really took me into my life studying mysticism and always having that, that natural bent towards discovery and exploration. But as a teenager, I was definitely super alternative, super goth, like uber goth. I took my job seriously as a goth. Like I was like, okay, <laughs> full black everything, full makeup, you know, anti-society, anti-religion, you know, like doing photo shoots where I'm like burning all sorts of relig religious paraphernalia, just going full till late 1980s alternative, Susie and the Banshees, Christian death, you know, ministry, all of that, going to the clubs. And by the time I was 18, though, my mom was looking at me one day. I had already graduated to high school and I was in a goth band and I thought I had everything going on, but she was just looking at me one day going like, you're just not happy. Like you're just always upset. And she's like, you know what? I think I have a book for you. And she said, come up to my library. And we walk upstairs 
she's a avid reader. She's you look at this whole wall; it's just filled with books, and she has read every one of those books, from history to fantasy to you know fiction. And she pulls out this book, and it's by this author, Carlos Castaneda. And the name of the book is Tales of Power. I was like, okay, I have no idea about this. I'm like, all right, I'll check it out. And so I went off and I started reading it. And I was like, oh my God, this is what's up. This is, wow, this is, this is all that I've kind of been feeling but actually put into a practice and an experience. It's not just people fantasizing about being having magical powers or being a witch or a warlock that we were doing in the goth scene, right? It's like, you know, with our light little Wiccan stuff and, you know, doing rune readings at the time. I was like, whoa, this is like a whole different thing that I have no clue about. And so I set about reading the entire, all of his books. This was in 1990. And so by 1991, I had read every Carlos Castaneda book. And I had never even smoked marijuana at that point, completely sober path, you know, a little light drinking. But, you know, my friends were always trying to get me to smoke weed. But I was like, you know what? When I finish these books, I'm going to go on a vision quest. And I don't even come from a lineage of you know, vision quest. I have no idea what that even is. But I'm in college at UC Santa Cruz. I have some friends who can get some, you know, mushrooms for me. And I basically go hike. I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time as well. And I went and hiked this mountain above the Bay Area. And I proceeded to take, as Terrence McKenna would say, a heroic dose as my first <laughs> ever dose. <laughs> and I was on a mountaintop by myself discovering my ancestors, discovering the land, discovering psychic abilities, and communing with existence on a profound level that awakened me. I was fully awakened. And yeah, and then I remember, you know, just epic. And I came back down the mountain and I remember talking to my mom. I was like, mom? She's like, what? I did mushrooms and she had this little brief little like little cry. And she's like, oh my God, you're gone. I'm like, no, I'm right here. I've returned. <laughs> and over the following years, I would take doses of mushrooms and just go into nature by myself and the land would speak to me. And whenever I would communicate these experiences to my friends at the time, they were like, we have no idea what you're doing. This doesn't sound like any sort of acid trip or mushroom trip we've ever had. The signs and the animals and the symbols would reveal themselves to me. And I just practiced the art of basically, you know, I call it sort of like discovery. And when I examine my own sort of chart around where Pluto is, there's certain gifts that everyone has. And I have the gift of recovering lost information. And I can, I can also find lost objects. Like if you lose an earring in the river, I can dive into that river and find it. It's not a problem. I know how to do that. It's just a, a whole navigation system and it's just built in and I just trust it. And so I just developed the art of listening and listening to the spirit and listening to the elementals. And I would find wisdom and, but I never found a teacher. I would find guides. Mm. But I never found a lineage. I never found a teacher. Even though I was introduced to the Mayan lineages by my first guide, Hun Batsman, uh, Kishe Mayan, in the early 90s, I was introduced to the Mayan calendar and the different signs and symbols of the letters of the Mayan alphabet, you know, in the sacred G, sacred T, sacred O, and he was teaching me these things. But yeah, it was just been a long walk of going like, I'm here to bring something new for humanity. And on one of those initial visions, I was looking out across the different valleys of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I just saw basically in the, er I'm talking early 90s, 92, I saw the matrix and I saw nature. And I was like, 
I think everyone's really lost in that grid, grid over there and that grid over there, grid over there. And I'm here restoring what it means to be a human being. And I was like, you know what? If people are ready for that, if they want that too, let's blow up this charade. And then this phrase came to me and I was, and it was just, well, why the fuck not? (laughs) I mean, let's (laughs) cross that threshold. And from that time in the early 90s Mm. till now has been a journey of holding that vision, but then trying to fit into the matrix and suffering by that and being confused by that. And also, there is a timing to this, it seems. And I think right Mm -hmm. now, we can all witness that we are in the season We're dismantling or removing ourselves from the systems that we grew up with and restoring ourselves as the true title, the true awareness, the true potency of what a human being actually is, is now. We're in that season. Mm. Beautiful. And, you know, I love, as we're recording this on this moon in Vedic astrology, it's the moon of the guru, of you becoming... Wow. Wow that guru and for me when i look at that as as outside of you know western colonization it's i become the understanding and that understanding is i am part of the whole i have access to that as i build relationships and so my question for you wes i see that you're building relationships with mother earth connecting with you know the mycelia kingdom Mm -hmm. which are amazing connectors for so many people who are, you know, trying to connect to the earth, you know, you speak a lot about I am the earth. Mm. What are ways that they can do so if they're not going to go up on a mountain and do mushrooms? What are small ways, you know, of habits or learning how to listen as you have learned that they can do in everyday life to connect? Mm, yeah, I, I well... <laughs> You know, walking a path of bravery is what we're really asking people to do here and restoring one's bravery to understand that everyone's been domesticated, to take that term from the the Castaneda Castaneda series of understandings Mm -hmm. that humanity has been domesticated. And what is it when a human being restores themselves as tabula rasa, the blank slate, and then begins to see that when they're no longer filled with the noise, which I also call the deception, and they can find their own inner navigation, then, you know, hopefully their truth before all programming will begin to fill them up. And I would say that the first step for that is silence. It's always silence. It's walking in nature or it's the simple thing of meditation. I'm an avid meditator as well. I began that, you know, again, when I was around 20, I started meditating hard. And just getting into silencing the mind, silencing the body. And that's how you got to empty the cup before it can be filled up. And I would say that that is really the first step. And it's that building the habit of one who is available is really the first step. Are you available? Mm. And, And spark up your bravery and be available to listening and receiving before you start talking a majority of human beings are uneducated about Mm -hmm. being a human being. Mm -hmm. I love that word, you know, sacred law, natural law. And what is that? That is the fact that we have never been abandoned. You know, we're in the intelligence. (laughs) And when you relax yourself into that, yes, you will be spoken to because you're available. Mm. Wow, what power to that phrase, we have never been abandoned. Mm, Yeah, yeah. To allow that to really seep into our bones and to our bodies. What a gift. And I know that Carlos Castaneda, who I enjoy as well, I think wrote a book, and please correct me if I'm wrong, The Power of Silence. Yeah, yeah. So you talk a lot about, you know, being in the noise 
and then stepping outside of the noise. And it seems that, you know, as we're in this phase of society of evolution and de-evolution, it's getting louder and louder and louder. So how are you, Wes, finding ways to, other than meditation, you know, step outside of that noise? Yeah, this is really tapping into us as sovereign beings mm. and realizing that the system utilizes the technique of repetition to get their messages drilled into you and drilled into the masses thinking that, well, that's the topic of the day. That's the only thing we can think about. Obviously, this is important. They, in quotes, are telling us, look at that top-down command system rather than a collaborative mutual respect system that's going on there. So we're removing ourselves from this old, archaic, like parent-child relationship and moving into equality. And to minimize the noise is to then definitely find your own inner campaign of power and put that on repeat. Are you repeating to yourself your own potency as much as the system is trying to put on repeat your impotence and your subjugation to them. So it really is, and often I'm, I'm talking to people saying like, okay, it's good to be aware about what's going on, but notice your own energy economy. How much of that is taking up your space? I would advise one to 5% of your attention should be placed on what the predator is doing, what the system is doing. And you better be able to witness your own inner energy inventory going mostly, you know, 95% at least going towards your own campaign of reestablishing your sovereignty and power. And often where a lot of people get lost and end up back in the system, back in the predator's design is that we get a lot of sold a lot, especially on Instagram, like, oh, economic sovereignty and do this and be a coach and do that. And it's like, that's good. But whatever that really is talking about ends up having you purchase back into the system itself. Definitely that, again, that connection between us and the land as one and the same thing. And we each have to become, yeah, free soil in which new seeds are planted. And, and what I'm getting at is that We've been handed a limited amount of blueprints that says, well, you're a human being, obviously you eat food, obviously you need an, a house, but those are kind of questionable actually, because look at how those are the most controlled, food, housing, money, land. It seems like we're playing somebody else's game when we need those things. And it's interesting to explore do we actually really need food and land and shelter? Mm. That ends up having us being separate from the intelligence of existence itself in the end. It gets us pretty comfortable and defensive. And like I said, I don't have quite have the answer because it's a group exploration that we're headed into as to, hmm, maybe some of those elements or the way they're defined are actually the habitat of the predator. Yeah. Maybe our vision of human life in all its needs and comforts are actually bait and food for the predator's habitat. So the more that we engage with that and sustain that, we're actually building their version of the world for them while we think we're building our version of the world for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's how deep you can go down the rabbit hole on that one. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I, there's like 5 million things I want to say now, but <laughs> I will not. But it's, it's a beautiful thing to explore, right? To stay yeah. curious, to stay courageous in it. And I think, you know, one of the things that I love about your exploration is, you know, let us have you know, this cultural exchange together and what does, you know, home mean to you? What does safety mean to you? Mm. What does, you know, being fed mean, you know, and you use the mm. word comfort, which I, I find 
is one of definitely the the ideas definitely in the United States, you know, that if you are not in comfort, you're doing something wrong. And I think definitely an exploration of that is a cultural exploration. Mm. As we continue to explore this cultural exchange, you touched about changing, you know, our habits of thinking and being and exploring that you talk about reclaiming or experiencing or finding the indigenous mind. And I'd love for you to explain that in your words. Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, thankfully, you know, on my journey, I've had the privilege of experiencing other cultures. And, mm-hmm. you know, originally I'm from Britain. I, though I don't have the accent anymore, my family and I left England when I was around two years old. We actually came to the United States on a ship and then ended up in upper state New York and then eventually moved across to California. So in some ways, I'm the in one lifetime, I'm the history of colonial America. <laughs> and from that point, um, I separated from colonial America and began to have the privilege of experiencing indigenous America. And again, going into nature, I picked up on the wisdom, right? When people live with the land, and they have reverence, and they're bonded, and they are the land. Mm -hmm. And those, I don't even want to use the word ritualistic. That's a very Western term in some ways. When the peoples of the land in which I grew up, Oholone, like in San Francisco, their rhythms, their minds are in the soil. And every culture's minds is in the soil when you repeat the planting cycles and the prayers and the observations. And so through my path with reading the Castaneda books, you know, the word Toltec came into my being. And I eventually ended up about five years ago, I'd been studying a lot of the Toltec wisdoms, but never having a direct experience and ended up in central Mexico, living outside of Mexico City in a village called Malinalco for about a year. I lived in um, this mountain village. Mm -hmm. And I was studying with different Mexican teachers, Toltec, Mexica teachers, and really letting that wisdom land in me from a knowledge point of view. But it was Malinalco, the land itself, that when I took the knowledge and I said, land, show me what this means because I know it's based around planting. I know it's based around where the sun is rising. I know it's based around where the stars are at and the Venus cycle and et cetera. And the land began to speak to me and say, okay, well, wait a second. You have to understand that the whole planet went through patriarchy. Okay. And all the different, you know, these different empires went through their, their own deceptive bullshit as well. And we want to return this to the feminine. We want to clean it up. Mm-hmm. So I had for a year, I was doing like energy knowledge cleanup until it became embedded wisdom in me. And I understood for the first time, okay, now I understand the planting cycle as also the creation story. And that the creation story is happening every day. And how does a seed come from the invisible, the nahual, the other side? Where does that energy of the eternal come in, then the ancestors come in Mm -hmm. and then form itself into a seed with its blueprint. And then that blueprint gets pointed and put into the soil and grown and the rising Eastern sun turns it into a sprout. And then as we move into the South, we're coming into the full maturation of the crop and living into that, all the beauty and the bounty of that. And then as we head towards the West, we're taking the bounty and getting the best gifts and understanding our sacred duty as a creator and a cultivator of seeds to give the best of the harvest to the West. For the Mexica, that's the land of Siwitlampa, the, the woman, the feminine, mm-hmm. to get as a divine masculine energy as we all mm-hmm. have that in us that take that energy of the one who shepherds the seed into maturation and takes the bounty, giving that up to the West to nurture the world to nurture your people, to nurture existence itself. And then to begin that cycle 
again the next day or to see that cycle annually and see that cycle as your entire life. So once I had that experience, then I'm like, okay, thank you for that privilege. Now taking this understanding, I have the next step of my journey, which is to go back to England and to revive the wisdom that's in the land there. Now that I've got what I call the universal or global indigenous mind, which is the one of who plants seeds, right? We're all planting seeds in every culture has these similar creation cycles and understandings and relationships with nature and the heavens and heavens as nature. And so that really is my next step is that, you know, I've been studying my own ancestry. I have the fortunate birth that my blood is actually from one place in Britain. I'm pretty like whole stock indigenous Britain. I live in Southeast England, which is a place called Kent. And the Kantiasi is the name of the Celtic tribe there. And I got to go back. I got to go back to my, like, to Kent and start listening to the land and say, okay, because there's so much that's been lost, right? 2,000 years ago in England, we were taken over by the Romans, the Holy Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And we were under Roman occupation for 400 years. And then after that, these different mercenary tribes came over from Germany, the Saxons, and then we were taken over by the Saxons, and then the Normans from northern France, and then you know we've had the Vikings come in as well, and we've had all these different ages of different people invading us and conquering us, and yet deep, deep, deep within the land, the real ancient Celtic truth needs to be revived. And that is my next quest. Mm. Beautiful. You know, I I love the language and the rhythm that uh, you take time to connect and to explore, to be in the moment and to be that seed and that knowledge. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah. I just want to... You know, we've been talking a, a lot about the moon and how it's supporting this conversation, but we are in the day, because I know you study a little uh, Mayan cosmology of 11 bats in the Tresena of Mish. So we're in mm. the day of creativity of the monkey with the underworld, the unknown, um, and that 11 really supporting us to step into that true manifestation of new. So I, I'm loving that we're talking about exploring, you know, unheard of ideas and concepts, you know, tearing down limitations. And I love that because it shows how our conversation is in rhythm, right? It is yeah. in relationship to the energies and how the energies are supporting us. And I think that is a, a gift to be, you know, following a rhythm of relationship. Right. You know, where the energies are supporting you and where you're being able to connect and mm, yeah. be part of it, you know, and not outside of it. Whenever I, I teach a lot of the mind calendar just to get people out of Western colonial mindset. And one of the things I always talk about is like, this isn't just about you memorizing. Mm. This is about you forming relationships being able to go and talk to the Nawales as they change shape and form. And that means you are changing as well. You know, evolution is part of this conversation. And so in your exploration of your mindset and your journey of your mind to your heart and to your body, that million mile journey, how, you know, or as, Carlos Castaneda says the riddle of the mind, right? Mm. <laughs> the riddle of the mind. How can you challenge people to explore their body as land? What are the conversations that you're having out there that people are really like getting it? And I'd love to hear your words. Mm, to have people really get how they can challenge themselves to go to this kind of next level. Yeah. 
you know, it's beautiful that you pulled up the word rhythm because I feel that also tied into your earlier question about how people start, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people start with the cycle of the moon. It's pretty obvious. You can see it, right? And it's Mm -hmm. different four stages, but that, that, yeah, there's rhythm everywhere. And it's really about understanding that we're surrounded and pounded by these creations that come from the industrialized mind and even the houses, the organization of how the walls are put up and the the way the direction of the house is, it's just complete industrialized human cattle organization. And so we're really sitting at this moment where we've got to play bigger and play harder. And as I was laying out today, even on Instagram, feeling this potency of how will we come together? Recognize that we are creators and we are needing to reclaim what we create and how we create. And as we gather our potency, to not model the potency of the industrialized human or the potency of the predator's habitat and definition. And this is really about us stepping into the true definition of the Aquarian age, which is collaboration. And often, again, when we start thinking in words of collaboration, we start thinking immediately like, well, who am I going to work with on a human-centric level? When the truth is, collaboration in the Aquarian age is defined by working with all beings of all expressions, right? The elementals, the plants, the animals planet at large, different star systems, all sorts of beings that we don't even have a clue about, but they are ready for us to work with them once we become unhooked and available. And there are new collaborations just waiting to happen if we call them into occurrence. And right now, I think the moment a lot of people going through is overwhelm and disconnection. And so these types of collaborations are going to assist people in finding that community. And again, community is not just humans. We have to enact the full level of community. And when we do, we're going to represent a potency that is at least equal to, if not greater than the predator's domain and set of subjugated humans. And I try to still steer clear of words like war or confrontation, but you know, there is a moment where we do have to stand up as warriors, not so much to fight, but to by aligning ourselves to this potency will, and I've seen it before, will dismantle the other obstructions or just take us to a realm where we're not even needing to deal with this anymore. We're just, we've matured. We've gone, we've gotten out of, maybe this is all, you know, in some ways, some days I look at this whole thing as, well, maybe this is how evolution always occurs, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to have this intensity of the pressure on you to have that diamond effect, but also back to seeds, right? You know, they talk a lot. I mean, if you think about what a seed has to go under the dirt, the seed has to go into complete darkness and compared to its size, think about how much dirt is pounded on top of that seed Mm -hmm. to then push hard for its journey towards the light and fulfilling its full design. So some days I'm like, yeah, there's an enemy and we got to fight it. And then some days I'm like, you know what? This is all being done for us utilize that force to catapult yourself forward while you do this restoration work that we're talking about where we understand, okay, you've got to reset your nervous system away from the industrialized human and you have to reset it to the point where you're comfortable going anywhere in the universe. And I would say that that is the number one work I've done is resetting my nervous system to being okay with being an extension of existence. And there is a big part of the work, right, Wes, to really step away from a human-centric 
viewpoint of reality and to enter into a different realm of where all kingdoms are sovereign, you know, to build relationship in that way, to recognize, like you said, that small seed, you know, we talk about in, in the traditions I come from, you know, we talk about humility being a very different definition of what, as you're spe- speaking, industrialized society, Victorian society and stuff, you know, and we speak about humility, true humility, because there's false humility is I'm no greater or lesser than any other being. That seed has a sovereignty that I have and it has wisdom to teach me. And therefore I will sit with that seed and its sovereignty for it to teach me about my sovereignty. Right. Instead of kind of, you know, the Western humility being about sacrifice and lack and, you know, martyrdom and things like that. So I love that you are inviting people using your language into this conversation or re evaluation of the self as a being, as a creature, as an element. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to stay curious and stay playful with you, Wes, and just ask you, you know, what is, you know, in your journey right now, what is making you excited and sparkle and what is giving back to you? What is filling your cup right now? Mm, That's an interesting question. (laughs) You know, as we, as we dump out, what is remaining in the cup of that, that, that limited self, that small self who is like trying to preserve something or trying to preserve safety when we deserve to feel safe in every expression of existence. That's what excites me is that, you know, I talk about I sometimes term it as that we are the precipice culture. And Hmm. what excites me is getting people to that precipice where we're able to freely leap off of it and reopen humanity to galactic level, not just awareness, but galactic level travel. And realizing that we are, our human bodies are the starships. And it's just interesting to see the hints of that in mainstream society, right, there's the new telescope that just turned on a few days ago. And funnily enough, it's called James Webb. Hello, Webb, Web of Life. Like, it, yeah, okay, no pun intended. We're looking at the Web of Life now even deeper than possible. And it's just, it keeps going and going and going. And so what excites me, what fills my cup up is realizing that we're free to go. And I always knew that we were free to go. But I didn't have the nervous system. I didn't have the training to understand that, you know, I used to think that I had to get rid of what made me human in order to explore the universe. Mm. But it turns out you don't have to because what we're cleaning out is that we've been sold a lie as to what humans are. That's what you really need to get rid of. The lie, the limitations, you know, you hear it all the time. You just listen for it for the programming of like, you know, oh, that's just, you know, human beings, human beings are flawed. This is all complete, you know, church programming, system programming, or like humans are limited or humans are always going to fuck it up. Give it, you know, da, da, da. It's like, no, that's not true at all. And so, yeah, all the all the body shaming, all the sex shaming, all every type of shame that's out there. Yeah, that's what needs to get cleansed. But now when we understand, thanks to the work of like, say, Dr. Bruce Lipton, and we're understanding epigenetics, and the more you look at it like that, then we're like, whoa, we are these incredible adaptation machines that at a certain point, our own biology will speed up. And we can turn off genes and turn on other genes more quickly as we gain the ability to fashion environments and systems that are here to witness our power, celebrate our power, and take us to new places. So I think what excites me is just building environments that do that for human beings. That's what I want. I, you know, I want to build what I call like attunement centers or like sacred centers where we're like, just spend time here. We don't need to do retreats anymore. We need to be doing attunements. 
we need to get humanity past the healing stage. You know, often I say like at a certain point, all healers will be out of a business if we do our job correctly, because Mm -hmm. healing is pretty indicative of the symptoms of a divorced society, a divorced body, a divorced mind from existence. And once you heal that, you won't have those symptoms because we get to the root cause, which is that divorce from you as the earth connected to the heavens. Once you heal that, then you're like, wait a second. Okay, well, let's leave that behind us. Now I'm good to go. Now how can I train my system? How can I train my muscles so that I can or we can, because I really believe in the collaborative aspect of this, travel to other places, whatever that looks like. And that's kind of the exciting thing because, again, as we open to it, it will tell us, you know, our own instructions. You will receive directions. (laughs) And I'm excited for that because right now I'm really over seeing humans continue to buy into their own limits. Mm. So true. And I love your excitement, you know, and I'm enjoying also looking at all those, as you said, all those new pictures coming in from the the telescope and just sitting there and being like, wow, this is amazing. (laughs) I also wanted to be an astronaut as a child. So I think we would have played well together. Yeah, definitely, definitely. (laughs) So I have a question. So you speak about, you know, in one of your videos about, I believe you use the term maxim of obsidian blade that awakens the indigenous mind being on earth with earth as earth. Mm. And do you have a similar maxim or I, I guess we could say mantra for people to reclaim their humanity? Hmm. Mm, that's interesting because again, we're fighting all the false images of what that is, the manipulated, yeah. manipulated human. And that's why I have been using a term called it human infinite. And sometimes people are like, oh, infinite, blah, 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 doesn't, it means limited. It's like, no, if you study Latin, it actually is synonymous with being boundless. Mm. So when I embrace that, as a maxim or a mantra, yeah, boundless. We are boundless. Especially when you spend time meditating, you're like, <laughs> you go into parts of your own head, you're like, am I even allowed to think this thought? Like, what the hell? Where, what is that? Like, just the most abstract access. And so we are, by nature, explorers and expanders and so as the human infinite, that's really, that's really what I want us to reclaim. And that means being someone who is boundless in their thinking and exploration. And I believe that that is our natural state. That is the true reclaimed title of a human being is one who without limits. And mm-hmm. when there is no limits, well, and again, watch the mind when you want to say, oh, I got no limits. You mean I can do, I can go get a house and I can get tons of cars and I can, you mean, yeah, you can fill your (laughs) life up with tons of the toys of the predator. Sure. Or we can start to understand that we're being asked to birth ourselves, to mature ourselves as a species that's equal to existence itself that is learning to become biologically harmonious with our own mind-body-spirit connection, Mm -hmm. harmonious with the land, and harmonious with the boundless. And often I laugh at that debate, is, is the earth flat or is the earth round? And I'm daring to say that earth is wherever you are. And Mm -hmm. since you can go anywhere, that means all of existence is the earth. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love that you took time to take away possession out of the definition of boundlessness, which I think is something that we have been taught. But I want to add to, since I'm just going to, you know, start weaving with you, just so you know, we're weaving together now. 
you know, I'm going to add to your, we are boundless, your maximum to in relationship to all. How does that feel? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Give it to me again. Like tell me in a sentence. Yeah. So, you know, your maxim yeah, of, yeah. you know, indigenous mind is on earth, worth earth as earth. And mm-hmm. so as you add, you know, to reclaiming humanity, we are boundless. I'm adding mm-hmm. in relationship to all mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. there is that idea again, as you stated, not of possessiveness, right. But of being in and recognizing the sovereignty of all yeah. and that you are part of that sovereignty. And yeah. then when you take yourself away or isolate yourself or possess, you know, as you're saying, mm-hmm. you are not part of that. So we are boundless in our relationship to the all. How do you like that one? Mm, do you like think that. we can work with that one? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. You know, it, it brings up respect, you know, respect yeah. for so- every being, sovereignty and you know, often when I'm walking, I do my best to remember that when I'm about to cross into a forest or a desert or whatever it is, there's usually like a moment where you're about to walk into it. I always do my best to ask permission. Yeah, I'm about to walk into sacred intelligence. I'm about to walk into another set of beings mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I always do that yeah, to walk, that's what it means to walk in that right relationship of respect of, yeah, it's not just humans here. Beautiful. Well, I have enjoyed this conversation. I'm looking forward to further conversations and continuing watching you on your videos on Instagram. Where else can people find you, Wes? Well, right now I'm initiating some new ways we can all hang out. I'm doing weekly meditations every Sunday that's free on Zoom. And I'm going to be launching some really cool deep dive book clubs where we study Tibetan warriorship. Mm -hmm. And that can all be found as I launch it either on Instagram at The Obsidian Blade or on the website at TheObsidianBlade.com. Beautiful. Well, we'll definitely check that out. And thank you so much for stepping into this circle, for having this cultural exchange. And as I mentioned before, you know, which was not recorded on the podcast, I just want to honor you and in your mm-hmm. walk and your medicine as you continue to, you know, walk that path, as we say in this circle of radical self love, which is that of acceptance of sovereignty of the all. And as we said, we are boundless in relationship to the all. So thank you for walking that path, Wes. Mm, Thank you, Marita. And this has been a beautiful circle with you and I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. Well, until next time, Wes, may you continue to be boundless. May you continue to be that light of inspiration. And I hope people will reach out to you and follow Wes if you're not and really be able to sit and listen to this human and and their experience and their medicine path for they walk what I would call a deep medicine path. And in honoring you and your people, Wes, we shall talk soon again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, it is with deepest gratitude that I bow to you for joining me on this podcast, this episode, this circle, this platica, this meditation, this remembering. I hope that you have stayed curious. I hope to see you in the circle again next week. So make sure that you like or follow. Until then, may you be blessed with abundance of peace and radical self-love.